So my house is on the biggest chunk of property in the tri-state area, about 108 acres, and was originally kind of a park, but wasn't supposed to be used as a park. Unfortunately, people from all over didn't get the memo that we had moved in, and therefore continued to party, to hunt, and to fish whenever they felt like it. Over the years, these problems began to go away, except for a couple. Before we talk about the perpetrators, or at least the leader, we should discuss what was behind the property and asylum. Mostly housing psychopaths, schizophrenics, and those who suffered mental breaks. It isn't rare to hear random screaming for no reason coming from over there. So back to the story. There were four men who kept coming back and hunting in the middle of the night. We let some people hunt in the night on Saturday nights, but for the most part hunting was off limits. We were never able to catch these four middle-aged men, who always wore masks. I mention that because the leader always wore a creative mask, an especially frightening one. Most of the time he bore a pig mask. The men were sneaky, they were smart, and that's what made them so scary. I had three encounters with them, the first being in June of last year. A few friends and I decided to go on an adventure through the woods and we discovered something frightening. We found a fortress, covered in beer cans, with a chair at the top. Being the teenagers we are, we decided to do the smart thing, and that was to destroy all the hunters' hard work by kicking the entire fortress down. Boy, we had screwed up. We later returned to that fortress to check up on it, and that's when it got scary. It was rebuilt, almost as a shrine to the last one and spray painted on the ground was, try that again, we dare you. Encounter number two happened during a simple walk at night. Sometimes when I get upset, I like to take walks throughout the woods. This time was at night, and just so happened, our favorite hunters were out hunting. I walked along, minding my own business, when I see the man in the pig masks, and he sees me. He knows my face, this becomes important later on in the story. I hear a deep laugh and he turns his gun towards me. I have no idea what he was planning, but I booked it out of our ASFP so I didn't have to figure out. Encounter number three, in my opinion, is the most blood curdling. It occurred only about a week ago and I was walking home from my cousin's house in the dark. I had my flashlight shining and I felt safe, but something was off. The barn lights were on, the barn lights are never on. No one ever goes in the barn, the floors are falling through. I simply brushed it off as a technical error, but then in the middle of the field I saw the man in the pig mask and he saw me, and his words have haunted me since he yelled them at me. You get out of here before I make you. The way he said it still frightens me. It was so angry, so vicious, so dead set on revenge. I haven't been in the woods since then. It was just later discovered that in the barn they had been setting up shop from time to time. So in conclusion, I just want to personally give a shout out to my friend in the pig mask. Let's not meet. Three years ago, I worked in an office as an administrative assistant. All I really did was make coffee, photocopy documents, and answer the telephone. I was 20 years old at the time. One day, around five months into working there, I found a card on my desk after coming home from lunch break. I opened it obviously. Inside it said, Dear Sarah, I enjoy working with you. Love from question mark. It didn't freak me out and I found it kind of sweet that someone had sent me a card saying how much they enjoyed working with me. When I asked around the office, no one seemed to want to own up. I brushed it off. It wasn't a big deal at all to me at that point. Four days later, after coming back from my lunch break, there were flowers left on my desk, but this time there was no card. Again, no one owned up, and to be honest, it didn't freak me out at all. I didn't really think anything of it. I was more intrigued and wondered who maybe had a thing for me in the office. I secretly hoped it was the really cute guy that were three desks away from me. At this point in my life, I was living between three addresses. One was my mom's house, one was my grandma's, and the other's was a friend's house that I went when I got fed up of them both. 
I received a card in the mail one day, around two weeks after the flower incident. The card was a little creepy this time. Whoever had sent it had super glued jelly beans to the outside, they are my favorite candy, and inside it read, Dear Blondie, you're brilliant. This time it unnerved me a little, as they obviously now know where I live, but I still put it aside and got on with my life, and didn't think too much of it. Three days later, another card appeared in the mail for me, but this time it hadn't been stamped, so they must have hand-delivered it, and delivered it to my grandmother's address. This time the card was actually written with letters cut out of a magazine like you see in those creepy stalker people doing in movies. It read, Dear Blondie, you have an amazing face. Remember the smile. Okay, now I was creeped out. Whoever it must have known where I was staying to make sure I received the card. Was I being followed, I thought? Whoever this person was, they kept sending me cards, and the cards became extra, extra creepy to the point where I would feel sick waking up in the morning and finding a card addressed to me. They had started drawing pictures of me in the cards. They knew me in situations I'd been in recently, like they drew a picture of me sitting on a park bench, or a picture of me sitting in a bar with a glass of wine. They weren't good drawings, but just incredibly creepy. I decided to go to the police as this person was clearly following me and knew where I was staying, on what night, and who to give these cards to. The police didn't really do much when I presented them with the 12 cards I had received, as obviously they didn't have any evidence on who it was, and I also had no idea. They just told me if I receive anything else to take it in, they'll log it for me or something. I took all of the cards into work. I cried to my coworkers. I even stuck them on the notice board in the office with a long letter explaining that I would appreciate if this person, whoever it would, would stop contacting me. I had meetings with my manager. I opened up to everyone about it, and I was told to take some time off work. I was allowed two weeks off. This went on for another five weeks where I would receive cards from this person literally every other day. The messages were becoming more creepy, and I was becoming increasingly scared. I was even scared to be on my own at any time. It really affected me. My mom and grandma decided to install security cameras on their properties to try and catch this person. Strangely, after this, my mom and grandma never received anything else for me. I stayed at my friend's house one night, and this person had some flowers delivered for me to her address. The flowers said the usual, dear blondie, blah blah blah. I managed to catch this person out this time though. As the flowers were from a florist, I frantically called them and asked who had sent these flowers as I am being stalked. They couldn't give me that information unfortunately. The only way they could was if a police officer came in and asked to see their records. The police did and I finally got some answers. The man who was stalking me worked in my office. He was a 63 year old man who lived on his own. The police told me once they had arrested him and they checked his personal computer, he had hundreds of images of me that he had saved from Facebook. He also had a picture of me in his wallet. So creepy old guy, let's not meet. I've usually been more active at night, usually out for walks, runs, or even just hanging out at the park. I was 17 at the time of this incident, and knew this area like the back of my hand. I'm not usually scared of being out alone, as I lived in a really good neighborhood. Always make note of a safe place to go, if in need of help. I was out for a run around 9pm. It was a beautiful night and I decided not to take my phone with me. During my run, I crossed through a field beside an indoor pool, which is a very well lit area. I had planned to go across the lot, turn right and head down by the river for the last stretch back home. I've always checked my surroundings, with my head on a swivel. I noticed a man to my left. Taking out my earbuds, I slowed my jog and approached him. Keeping about two arms lengths between us, I asked him if he was lost, and he let me know that he was looking for the soccer center. I gave him very, very clear instructions, and he repeated them back to me. He thanked me and hesitantly went on his way. 
My jogging route was on the same path, so I was able to watch and see if he was able to reach the destination. However, I kept that to myself. As I jogged on, I noticed the second person in the parking lot. He was looking on his phone, but all other vehicles were empty and turned off. His was running. At the time, I thought nothing of it and continued on. I rounded the corner and the guy I spoke with had got stuck at a light, but he turned beside me shortly after, then stopped about five car lengths ahead and parked. He got out of the vehicle, which he turned off, and came to ask for more instructions. I kept my distance best I could, and again instructed him to go up half a block and turn at another right. He then started tapping his pockets and told me he locked himself out of the vehicle. He checked the two doors on the driver's side, and then, since I was on the sidewalk, asked me to try the others. I did, and they were locked. He then came around beside me and checked the rear passenger door again, despite me trying it already. I backed away and told him I'd be right back. I was going around the corner. I ran to the gas station. No one would let me use the phone, policy for customers only, and no one had a coat hanger, so I casually walked back. It was then that I saw from a distance the second guy in his vehicle parked five-ish car lengths behind the first guy, and I watched as the first guy got back into his vehicle and they both drove off quickly in the same direction. It was at that moment I realized he never was locked out, he never needed directions. And all this was a ploy to kidnap somebody. I spun on my heels and walked back on the busiest streets. No shortcuts, no back alleys, and no parking lots. I will never leave home without my phone again, and I'm so happy I kept my distance while interacting with him. I rarely ever think of this. I think I mostly blocked it out. I'm a female. When I was 25, I was in a transition period of my life. I was divorcing my husband and moving back to my home state to figure things out. My aunt had a small 1500 square foot 1950s house in a quiet neighborhood. Doors that stick, squeaky f wood floorboards type of place. She had moved out but couldn't commit the cell. She was happy to let me live there for a bit. I lived in the house for about s five months. This house was a single story home but it was on a hill. So if you went back around the house, outside, you could walk through a door into a small basement of sorts that you could stand in. If you were in this small basement and continued to walk toward the front of the house, you would quickly be crouching, then crawling. It was a small concrete storage area, and it was under what was my bedroom. One thing I remember about this place is that it was creaky and not well insulated. The floors were creaky, and when you were down in the basement area, you could see some light coming through the cracks in the bedroom floorboards. I maybe went down there once, got creeped out, and left. It was around the back of the house like I said, and I had no reason to even be back there. Being 25 and recently leaving my husband, I will admit, I had a few guys over. So I get my dream job, and I'm moving out of the house. I am also moving out of the state. My aunt has one request of me, to turn the water off at the street before I leave. So right before I leave the house, I turn the water off at the street. I come back inside and turn on the tub faucet. No water. I have done my job. However, this is where fate steps in, and I left the faucet turned on. Didn't think to turn it back off. I drive away to my new life. A few days later, my aunt calls. She is upset because the water company has called her to say that there is an unusually high amount of water running at her home. I promised her that I turned the water off and told her about checking the tub. So I'm out of state, she is out of state, so my mom gets recruited to go over and figure out what's going on. Well, come to find out, the neighbor husband from next door had been kicked out. He was living in the little room under my bedroom. He had strung an electric cord over the fence from his house. He had clothes and a toothbrush. I guess he was bathing in our yard, and I turned off the water. He went right back to the street and turned it back on. He had been living right under my bedroom floorboards. I am tense, remembering this. I never want to meet this guy. So creepy guy, let's not meet. 
Hi there. I just wanted to start off that this happened way back, so all the information is kind of hazy, but I'll try my best. Also, I'll be using fake names for safety reasons. Almost five years ago, my wife and I had our first child. It was the best moment of all our life. Skip ahead three months. All of our family from both sides were over for a barbecue. Everyone had a good time. At 11-ish, everyone started heading out. We put Ali in her crib and started to clean up. Me and Mika went to bed pretty easy. It was about 2.30, Mickey shook me awake and she was breathing heavily. I asked, what's wrong? She was holding the baby monitor to her chest. She started rambling on about how she thought that it was me or something. I finally snatched the monitor from her. I wish I could unsee what I saw. The monitor was pointed at the crib, but also at the room a bit. And someone was holding our child and walking around with her as anyone would put a baby back to sleep. I called the police right away and then grabbed my gun. I started to walk out of bed, but Mika stopped me. What if he does something to Ali? I was mad, but she was right. If I busted in there, he would probably drop my baby. After the longest 13 minutes of my life, we heard sirens. My eyes were glued to that monitor as he placed her in the crib and went into the closet. My wife sprang to the door and led the officers to the baby's room. They brought out the guy and put him in the cop car. I walked up to the car and just stared at him. He was your typical meth head hoosier. He mouthed something that gives me the chills to this day. She's a cute kid. The cop car drove off while I just stood really mad and scared. I couldn't sleep for a solid two days after that. So Method, let's not meet.